Welcome to the house of Lechmere and my second video about the Long Island serial killer and the Jack the Ripper case. In the first episode, I went through the Long Island case, the murders, the investigation and the suspects. In this episode, we're going to look at the connections between the Long Island serial killing, murders and Jack the Ripper. Most of the following issues run counter to the many myths about serial killer behaviour, which some people trot out as an act of faith based on uh, outdated and discredited FBI theories. Some alert viewers will have already noted multiple crossovers uh, and let me thank those who have contributed their ideas in the comments that were attached to part one. These contributors have been listed in the description below and they'll be, at the, they'll be listed at the end of the film. And they might recognise the points they made in this video, hopefully. Please forgive me if you feel that I've missed your name off the list. Before I get into these crossovers, you may wish to refresh your memory by reviewing part one. I'll put a link also in the description below, just in case. Anyway, first I'll go through a few general points of comparison. Most, not all it is true, of the Long Island victims I discussed were known to be prostitutes, sex workers, escorts. Now this issue of terminology, by the way, was brought up in one of the comments on the last video, and I'll come back to it in a future uh, short film, as it is an interesting uh, subject. By the miracle of film, we are now transported to the mean streets of the East End of London, the same streets that during the reign of Queen Victoria were stalked by that depraved serial killer known to history as Jack the Ripper. Anyway, similarly, all the known Jack the Ripper, Whitechapel and Thames Torso victims were prostitutes, despite some recent inaccurate claims to the contrary. Of course, some of the uh, torso victims were never identified, so we can't be totally sure with them. And incidentally, serial killers frequently target prostitutes, but it's seldom because they are, they are down on whores in that awful expression. It's more that prostitutes can be picked up and will readily go with the killer to the quiet location. As horrible as it sounds, they are the easiest and most available type of victim. There were taunting phone calls in the Long Island case and there were taunting letters in the Jack the Ripper case, if you accept that some or any of them were genuine. The core Long Island cases, the Gilgo Four, who are mentioned in Rex Human's in indictment, were strangled and there are claims that Shannon Gilbert was also strangled. With the other cases, which were dismemberment torsos, we're less sure as the heads were removed. The Jack the Ripper victims seem to have been strangled uh, before they were attacked with a knife. In the case of Shannon Gilbert, the police are still maintaining that it's their belief that she was not murdered. A separate autopsy was performed by Michael Baden, which revealed um, evidence that she may have had an in injury to her neck that was suggestive of strangulation. However, some of her, th uh, some of her throat bones were missing, which may, may well have been due to scavenging animals. Her body was in the open for a year and a half before it was discovered. These animals could also conceivably have moved the body and she was found face up, which Baden suggested implied she hadn't drowned. But uh, Baden also said that the body showed no signs of death caused by a drug overdose. But Shannon was bipolar and didn't take her meds, which made her irrational. She was a regular drug user and may have been under the influence of these or alternatively, alternatively in withdrawal from not using drugs. She sounded irrational on her recorded 911 calls. I'll put an, a link of those. There's quite a few things in the links in the description. I'll put a link to these calls in the description if you want to listen to her. It's quite harrowing in a way. The harmful effect of these drugs need not purely manifest itself in an overdose. Most theories suggesting Shannon's death 
uh, was a result of foul play involved complex conspiracies. The two key witnesses, her driver and her customer, passed quite reliable and stringent lie detector um, tests. There was also a strange man called Dr P Peter Hackett living in the, same, in the same gated development, but he was also cleared. And most theories involve, uh, in a conspiracy involve a cover-up involving the local police, but this all seems very unlikely to me. For Hureman to be involved, he must have presumably been coincidentally driving past as Shannon appeared by the road, which also seems very implausible. Incidentally, it's often said that the Shannon Gilbert case led to the discovery of the other Gilgo Beach murders. However, I'm not entirely sure that this is true. The police cadaver dog, which is called Blue, which was um, searching Gilgo Beach, um, who this dog found the four bodies, was, I believe, in the first instance, when it found the first body, on a training exercise with its handler, rather than conducting an extended search for Shannon's body. <sighs> Remember, the local police were under corrupt leadership at the time, so I have a feeling that the police made the best of a fortuitous discovery and claimed that it was a deliberate search rather than a, rather than a random piece of luck. In comparison to the Shannon Gilbert case, during the Jack the Ripper investigation, we have Rose Milet, who died in December 1888 in Poplar, just behind me now, just over here. Various doctors performed post-mortems on her body and declared uh, that it was a case of murder by strangulation. That was also the finding of the, of the inquest into her death. However, Robert Anderson, head of the Criminal Investigation Department at Scotland Yard, didn't accept this finding and refused to investigate Rose Milet's death of murder. He believed she had uh, died uh, through uh, uh, strangling herself on her, on her collar. In, in this, the Rose Milet case has much in common with that of Shannon Gilbert, although I personally believe it likely that, that uh, Rose Milet was murdered. And also, there's a good chance that the culprit was the same person who had committed the other uh, Jack the Ripper murders. And inevitably, I think the person responsible, in all probability, was Charles Lechmere. Whereas with Shannon Gilbert, I think it likely that she did indeed die as a result of an unfortunate accident. I'll provide links in the description below to my previous videos which discuss the Rose Milet case for those who wish to know more. There is the claim that serial killers never stop unless they, uh, they die or caught or otherwise incarcerated. Rex Hewerman seems to have stopped about 13 years ago and I speculated as to one reason why that might have been. We also have the recent notorious case of the Golden State Killer. Joseph D'Angelo, who was married with three kids and was caught 22 years after he had stopped via a DNA link. Another notorious serial killer, Dennis Rader, known as BTK for Bind, Torture, Kill, also stopped. Due to advances in technology, cold cases can be solved when this wasn't previously possible. It's a ridiculous falsehood to suggest that serial killers do not stop until they're caught, die, or perhaps commit suicide in, in shock at their acts, or their, their mind gives out, it gives away, and, and they're locked up in an insane asylum. These ludicrous melodramas still inhabit the underbelly of what is ludicrously known as ripperology, and merely serve to demonstrate that the person who suggests such things knows nothing about the subject. Serial killers can and do stop, and often continue to live outwardly normal lives. I believe that Charles Lechmere was Jack the Ripper and I believe he stopped and continued to live an outwardly normal life. I'm frequently asked a variation on this theme, why Lechmere stopped. Serial killers stop for their own reasons which normally normal people can't fathom. In the same way that serial killers don't usually have a motive as is usually understood by that term. Revenge for catching syphilis to scare off their girlfriend off a life on the streets, a financial motive or as part of a government or secret service conspiracy, 
I'm sure you can think of other melodramatic reasons which are sometimes proposed by the naive and credulous. The act is the motive in itself. It is invariably about exercising power and control, literally the power over life and death, but also to act out sexual fantasies. I'll give one probable universal reason for serial killers stopping, and that is age. As one gets older, one's strength and vitality diminishes. Usually sexual appetite declines and there's usually an underlying sexual motivation behind these killings. Hence, the motivation to continue carrying out these types of crimes diminishes over time. In Human, we have a prime suspect who seemingly has no previous criminal record. He had not attracted the attention of the police as a petty criminal or some such prior to his arrest. It's another fiction that we should expect that Jack the Ripper had a long list of form. One of the discredited objections against Lechmere is that he had no known previous convictions. Hewerman was a family man with an unsuspecting wife and two kids. It's not at all unusual for a serial killer to have an outwardly normal family life. One of the discredited objections against Lechmere is that he had a wife and multiple children. Uh, families were, of course, commonly bigger in the Victorian period than, than nowadays. Hewerman held down a stable job. He actually ran a successful architectural business with a prestigious address in Midtown Manhattan, uh, part of New York. One of the discredited objections against Lechmere is that he seemingly held down a regular job in 1888 as a carman, a delivery driver with a horse and cart for the haulage firm Pickfords. And Lechmere then went on to run a string of businesses in the East End. Hewerman left the bodies in an area he was very familiar with. He operated in his comfort zone. He would have known that Gilgo Beach was a very secluded spot. Lechmere similarly killed in his comfort zone, the areas of the East End in which he lived here and worked, and where he knew all the streets and alleys and knew how busy each place was likely to be. The case against Hewerman is based on circumstantial evidence, yet that is enough for him to have been charged. There is his ownership of a Chevrolet Avalanche, in the first part, I kept on saying Cherokee Avalanche, I'm afraid. But tens of thousands of people owned these vehicles. This piece of evidence put the spotlight on Hewerman as a suspect. The witness who saw this uh, vehicle at Amberlyn Costello's house actually identified as a dark pickup truck with a triangle shape on the back, not specifically as a Chevrolet Avalanche. The triangle shape is interpreted to be the V in Chevrolet, which is on the back of the truck. This puts into even greater perspective the circumstantial nature of the evidence against Hewerman. In part one, I mentioned the DNA, DNA evidence, which was a 99% match for Hewerman, which may sound good, but it also means it's shared by 1,500 of the 150,000 Long Islanders who also work in New York. Similarly, his wife's DNA is also a 99% match, and it's this combination which narrows things down considerably. Then there's the, the phone evidence from the burner calls traced to the various um, phone masts. But hundreds of thousands of people work in Midtown Manhattan, and any one of those could have conceivably made these calls. But only a few thousand also live near the mast in Massapequa. It's the sheer accumulation of circumstantial evidence that mounts up to make a most probative case and a jury would not like it. One of the discredited objections against Charles Lechmere is that the evidence against him is circumstantial. He deliberately withheld the name Lechmere from the authorities and only gave the name Cross, which wasn't his true name, despite swearing on oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. His route to work took him past many of the crime scenes at the times they were committed. He had huge connections 
connections to Pynchon Street, the location where one of the torsos was dumped. The only murders committed on Saturday night, Sunday morning, preceding Lechmere's probable day off, his day of rest when he didn't have to go to work next day, were those known as the double event. The first murder, that of Liv Stride, a short distance up there, happened very close to where his mother was living with one of his daughters. Damningly, Lechmere was seen by a witness, Robert Paul, standing alone, very close to a freshly slain victim, Polly Nichols, just around the corner there, and the body showed signs that the killer had been disturbed or interrupted by somebody. There was a gap in the timings given by Lechmere and Paul that would allow Lechmere to have committed the murder. If Lechmere was innocent, he would have been walking a short distance in front of Paul, down those quiet streets, down this street, before Paul saw him by the body. But Paul neither saw nor heard Lechmere. Paul and Lechmere left the body and spoke to a policeman they bumped into some distance down the road in this direction. But the policeman, PC Misen, reported the conversation as being very different to the version supplied by Lechmere. PC Misen said he wasn't even told that there was, there was a dead woman involved. This circumstantial evidence hurts Lechmere by its sheer accumulation and circumstantial evidence is enough to convict if it all points in the same direction. Have you agreed with me so far? Comment below and please subscribe and like. We've got more to come on the connections between the Long Island serial killer and Jack the Ripper. I hope you've noticed that most of the Long Island serial killing murders were torso or dismemberment cases. A possible motivation for this being that it's easier to dispose of the victim's body and or perhaps the killer had longer with the, de with the uh, dead victim to allow for these actions. He might just have preferred to carry out mutilation murders sometimes and not others for his own personal and to us unfathomable reasons. Whatever the case might be, the four core Gildo, Gilgo Beach murders were not torso or dismemberment cases. These victims had just been strangled, if I can say just in, in such circumstances. Nevertheless, based on a common type of victim, the very close geographic proximity and the timescales involved, it was or is entirely sensible for the police to treat them as all probably being from the same hand. And I strongly suspect that as this case develops, this will be how it turns out. The Golden State Killer, Joseph D'Angelo, who I mentioned earlier, was found to be responsible for several different serial killing and sexual crimes and murders across California, which were originally believed to be unrelated until the culprit was caught. Conversely, another serial killer in California, known as the Freeway Killer, turned out to be three different serial killers. Uh, this seems to argue in the opposite direction, but the murders were spread over a much wider area and timescale, and although there was a, a common gay aspect to all the murders, the victims were not otherwise similar. While the Jack the Ripper murders were taking place, there was another series of murders known as the Thames Torso murders that had a common type of victim, geographic proximity and overlapping timescales with the, with the Whitechapel murders. Yet, in the world of Ripperology, it's only because of the candidacy of Charles Lechmere as Jack the Ripper that serious consideration is being given to the notion that the Thames Torso and Jack the Ripper murders were by the same hand along with the other Whitechapel murders. An obvious reason why some Ripperologists are blindly resistant to the suggestion that the, Jap the Ripper murders, the wider Whitechapel murders and the Thames Torso murders might have been committed by the same culprit is that the Ripperologist concerned favours one of the other discredited and totally unrealistic suspects who had committed suicide, been executed, was dead through some other means, had left the country or was locked up in an asylum and so couldn't have been responsible for all of them. So inevitably they can't entertain the idea that many of these unsolved murders in late Victorian London may have been committed by the same person. 
soon incidentally I'll start a series on this channel looking at some of the other Jack the Ripper suspects. That will be something to look out for. There is so much more to discuss on this subject. But let me continue. I've noted the importance of the Chevrolet Avalanche in the arrest of Human and the significance of this piece of evidence being initially missed until a new set of eyes looked at the case. This may never have happened had the local police chief, James Burke, not been jailed for the abuse of his position. Other suspects and leads had long attracted the police investigative focus in the Long Island serial killing case. The Jack the Ripper case had no new set of eyes to look at the evidence. It's often claimed uh, that the police during the Ripper case were so super efficient that they must have thoroughly checked out Lechmere even though they never discovered his true name and only knew him by his alias, uh, Charles Cross. It's clear that the police didn't do a thorough job during the investigation into, uh, into the Polly Nichols murder. For example, they failed to interview all the residents in this road, which was called Bucks Row at the time. Uh, they feel they, the coroner himself criticised them for not doing this. And we know they initially missed a lady called Harriet Lilly, who lived just down there, two doors from the crime scene, who gave a press interview a week after the murder, recounting her recreated memory from the week before. Also, for three days, the police believed that PC Neil discovered the body rather than Cross, uh, as Lechmere called himself, with Robert Paul. Serial killer cases invariably baffle the police with a mass of evidence, new victims and a multitude of misleading lines of inquiry. Information overload and various suspects to focus on blurs the picture. In the Jack the Ripper case you need think no further than Leather Apron, a false suspect who dominated police thinking for the first few weeks of the investigation. It seems that Human plotted the kill killings near his workplace. Many of the calls were tracked on the burner cell phones were made very close to his work. He was not inhibited by the proximity of his workplace, nor was he in a sort of blinkered work mode and unable to plot his secret activities whilst at work or near his work. He brought burner phones and pay-as-you-go top-ups uh, for these phones while at work. It was a familiar location for him and as such no doubt provided uh, a degree of mental security. He committed his crimes when and where it was convenient for him. Similarly, for Charles Lechmere, the most convenient time for him to commit crimes would have been while he's on his way to work, when the streets were dark and quiet and mostly inhabited by the, by the last remaining street prostitutes, which were also his quarry. Going into his job after committing a murder would have represented no problem, as he worked in cavernous, dark, labyrinthine, subterranean stables, which conveniently also had washrooms and plenty of opportunity to clean up if necessary. This leads us to the geography of the Long Island case. When we look at where the bodies were dumped, where the burner calls were made, where a Chevrolet avalanche could be placed, where Human lived and works, it all fits like a glove. On its own, the geography would not be enough, even though it shows opportunity. In conjunction with the other circumstantial evidence, it becomes compelling and makes up a large proportion of the police case against Hewerman. Similarly, the geography of the Lechmere case is compelling. It isn't geographic profiling and neither is it in the Long Island case. But we have where Lechmere lived, where he worked, where his mother lived, where one of his with one of his daughters, where his aunts and in-laws lived. They fit the crimes like a glove and not just the Jack the Ripper murders, but a whole series of others. They were the areas that Lechmere would have been familiar with, and that is what the police look at, just as the police in the Long Island case are also looking at South Carolina, New Jersey, and Las Vegas. We know that Lechmere was almost alone in the streets on the early hours. There were not thousands of people around. The streets where he lived 
not the vague district of St George's in the east, for example, but the specific area around, say, Pynchon Street. Narrow it down to Lechmere alone, not the multitude in the rest of the East End. When you get down to those specifics, the few closely defined streets, the routes to work, the direction of travel from where the bloody apron was dumped after the murder of Catherine Ellis in Golst on Golston Street, which points directly towards his house at Dufton Street, it all points to Lechmere, as surely as the phone masts point to Hewerman within the wider area of Massapequa. I hoped I pronounced Massapequa properly. I was picked up on my, uh, my pronunciation by several, by several people in the last video. We have Hewerman very likely murdering Amber Costello partly out of anger because he had been ripped off in a scam the day before. He took a great risk in killing her because he had been seen by a witness and his car had also been seen. And I noted that while most murders took place in June or July and were mostly a year apart, this month was just four months after the previous one and was carried out in September. Annie Chapman was murdered just eight days after Polly Nichols. I've theorised that Lechmere prioritised killing again quickly after Polly Nichols and in the location where it happened on Hanbury Street to throw suspicion on Robert Paul, who worked very nearby to the murder scene, to the, to the Annie Chapman murder scene. This was partly, in my opinion, in anger at Robert Paul for going to the press and placing Lechmere alone and right next to a freshly slain corpse, which in turn forced Lechmere to come forward and appear into the in at the inquest into Polly Nichols's death. I mentioned that Hewerman used aliases to set up email addresses and register for sites such as Tinder to keep the sexual predator side of his life discreet from the official public side. One name he used was Thomas Hawke and another John Springfield. For his Tinder account, he used his real middle name, Andy, with a made up surname. It was actually Andrew Roberts. That was the full name he used. This information was obtained by the police from his American Express account, which was in his real name. The police tracked Hewerman's online payments and activities. His online identity, this fake identity was easily established by the police once he was in the frame but until he was in the frame he was secure in using this alias he was anonymous which is why people like him tend to use aliases similarly Charles Lechmere used an alias Cross when dealing with the police in the Jack the Ripper inquiry his true identity remained unknown to the police and indeed to the whole world, including his family, until about 15 years ago when researchers discovered that Char the Charles Cross involved in the Polly Nichols murder was in fact Charles Lechmere. It's only when Charles Cross becomes Charles Lechmere that he is in the frame and his actions can be put under the microscope, as with Hewerman. Hewerman's classmates at his high school reported that they believed that in the aftermath of his father's death, his mother was controlling. He was by then effectively brought up in a single parent household. Also, that he had had a fraught relationship with his father. Charles Lechmere's father, John Lechmere, abandoned his family when Charles Lechmere was quite young. His mother ended up conducting two bigamous marriages. Charles Lechmere's mother seems to have had an important, even controlling influence over his life. One of Charles Lechmere's daughters was brought up by his mother. His mother ran a wholesale cat meats business and one of Charles Lechmere's sons, Thomas, went into, the cat, into cat's meats haulage and later opened his own uh, cat's meats business in succession to his grandmother. Up until 1888, when the Jack the Ripper murders commenced, Charles Lechmere lived very close to his mother's apron strings. 
The Long Island serial killer was almost certainly a psychopath, a condition which is nearly always inherent. Sometimes there's belief that you're going to hit your head, you can have the same effect on your brain. But it will have almost certainly been with him from birth. But not all psychopaths become murderers, and not all are even potential murderers. Many get satisfaction from their everyday lives. Uh, being a successful businessman, for example, and doing down their business rivals, or, by, or through the exercise of power over their subordinates. Others might uh, have the same sort of behaviour in politics or in the military. Others might be more naturally timid or scared of fulfilling their violent fantasies, whereas other, others still might have triggers which excite them in the opposite way, into wishing to fulfil these fantasies. Human as an architect was involved in many, would have probably been involved in many zoning or planning cases with New York City. And the cut and thrust of these cases might have given him satisfaction, which might account for the long gaps between the murders. I've also mentioned in the other film, the first film, the Amityville connection. And this is why I think it's probably significant. It provided an exciting example that gained national attention just as the Long Island serial killings gripped the nation uh, some t years earlier, the Amityville murders did the same. And Hewerman, remember, was brought up just a few miles away and was at an impressionable age, about 12, when Amityville happened. Similarly, Charles Lechmere was brought up very close to where an earlier gruesome and brutal series of murders had occurred, the Ratcliffe Highway murders. Watch my film, The Evidence of Guilt, part five. Link below for details on this. Now, the amount of detail you can potentially go into on the Long Iron serial killing case is almost unending. And I've, I've tried to simplify it, uh, yet mention all the key points which I think are important. It's a very complex case, which is no doubt why it baffled the police with one murder after another and multiple bodies uh, being discovered in a short space of time they would have suffered from information overload. That's probably why key uh, pieces of evidence were missed, if I'm going to be charitable towards them, but you know, they did blunder. Much more significant information will no doubt come to light from the searches they've been carrying out. I'm confident that this will reinforce the points that I've made here, and as the case comes to trial. The old discredited myths about serial killer behavior that often resurface as misguided objections to Lech, the Lechmere theory will be shown to be totally without merit. The study of modern cases such as the Long Island serial killer case tells us a great deal about Jack the Ripper. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe and share. Comment below on whether or not you agree with what I've said or whether you think it's just a load of old nonsense. Do you think I've missed anything out? Anyway, look out for my next film. Goodbye. <laughs>